notes if you're, there's two different computers. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for coming to Democracy Days. This is the 23rd annual Democracy Days. It's been happening every year since 2001, which is when I graduated from high school. So that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, this panel, we're talking about um, the story that black cemeteries, in particular Greenwood Cemetery, can tell, and the story it can tell us about history in St. Louis and its surrounding area. Um, and sort of the importance of black history. So our panelists today are me. My name is Grace Wade Moser. I am history faculty here on campus. Um, sitting next to me is Ms. Shelley Morris. She is um, the board secretary for Greenwood Preservation Association and she's a historian for the cemetery. And uh, next to Shelley is Ms. Etta Daniels. She is the historian for Greenwood and sort of the person who saved it <laughs> from obscurity and um, saved it from revitalization of being plowed over and turned into 
um, just regular old, like, I don't know, what do they want to turn it into? They just so want to turn it into buildings and stuff, like oh, industrial yeah, they, stuff? Actually, the first idea was to up to uh, dig up over 3,000 bodies and put them in a mass grave mm. for a park. Oh, that would be yeah. such a nice park to dig yeah. up 3,000 bodies and make it into a nice park. And then last on the end is Kiana Dordor, who is, did I say that right? Okay, a uh, Washington University student, but also intern for Greenwood Cemetery Preservation Association. And um, she's gonna be talking about her experience with um, civic engagement um, and what she's had with Greenwood. So I'll start us off. Um, this panel is also a, a panel that we're going to present at a national conference in the spring um, for the Organization of American Historians. You guys get to be our test subjects. We get to practice on you. Um, but we're going to be sharing the work that Greenwood has done and that SEC has done with Greenwood. So it's a really cool opportunity. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is why there's a need for um, learning black history and what um, black cemeteries can offer, like where they can fill a void that is now existing. Um, so this map that you see here was made in 2021, and it shows all the states that have introduced legislation to either ban the teaching of critical race theory, which, by the way, no schools are teaching critical race theory. That's a misunderstanding of something that is in law school that's taught legal justification in law school. Um, when they say critical race theory, they really mean black history. Um, so banning black history and or um, banning teachers from discussing race or sexism or gender. Um, so Florida has been in the news a lot lately because they have banned, um, they have the don't say gay law. Um, so teachers <laughs> are in the fear of losing their jobs if they say anything that a parent could consider a violation of this law. And there have been teachers who have lost their law, uh, jobs over it. Um, and uh, the, probably the, the dominant states that are in the news are the ones that you see in light blue. So um, it's kind of hard to see in this image, but um, it's these states right here um, and these states up here. So it's not just the South that's trying to ban black history, but some of the most uh, notorious of them are Florida and Texas. That's what's getting a lot of the news uh, released right now. I'll point out that Missouri has also introduced a bill that would ban um, the teaching of black history, um, but it has been blocked in the state legislature. So it has not become law yet. And I say yet because it's still a possibility because that is the story of Missouri <laughs> state legislature. Um, we vote for something, we say we don't want something, and then they figure out a way to make it still happen, which has happened so many times, more times than I can count. Um, so this map shows the states that have restricted or limits how teacher can teach, teachers can teach about black history. Um, I wanted to discuss um, public history as an alternative um, to these backlashes against teaching black history. So there's a long history of African Americans attempting to get their histories discussed and talked about in school and their contributions shared. And I was attending a um, session in with the Memphis um, Lynching Society. Um, they had a panel presentation while they were trying to get this sculpture put up. This is of my personal hero, Ida B. Wells Barnett. It's a public statue that was publicly funded um, in its entirety um, in memorial to Ida B. Wells. And they had a special presentation where they had Ida B. Wells's great granddaughter. And I asked a question in one of the sessions where I said, what, is, what should our response be to the bans against critical race theory? Like, wh how can we counteract this as instructors? And she said something that I'll never forget. It really stuck with me. She said, we've always been fighting for this. It goes back and forth. It's always been an inclusion. She said, I think we need to focus on public history. And that set something off on me. Like, we're always going to have struggles about what we can teach in classes. Um, and there's also going to be a mass exodus of teachers um, who don't want to be restricted by those things. Um, and public history can become the outlet for making sure that story still gets told and it's important to the US. Um, so that's why I bring up the 1619 Project, which is actually what triggered a lot of these bills about banning critical race theory. Have any of you guys ever heard of the 1619 Project? Yeah, um, it is a series of essays that was published in the New York Times Magazine 
I think, New York Times, not the New Yorker. Um, and its its opening article is by um, author Nicole Hannah Jones, who um, was actually she has an interesting story. She was on a tenure track position at the University of North Carolina, and they denied her tenure. Um, because they succumbed to the backlash against the arguments that she was making, and now she um, is tenured faculty at an HBCU. I don't remember which one, but um, she and she was trying to like, you know, academically discuss Black history and, and its inclusion, and the backlash actually kept her from getting this position. But I'm teaching this um, series of articles. Her first essay is called "Democracy," and I'm teaching it in my um, African American history class this semester. And one thing that really struck me is she makes a really important argument about the need for teaching black history and the way that we can engage with it. She said, the very foundation of democracy in America comes from African Americans and from African Americans fighting to fulfill the promise of the United States. So she says, she talks about 1619 being a pivotal year because that's when the first slaves arrived um, in the colonies predates the Pilgrims, predates the, um, the Mayflower Compact, which is often viewed as like the beginning, the origin of democracy. And slavery was the reason why Virginia came into the American Revolution, um, because uh, the governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, wanted to free the slaves um, as a military strategy. And that angered the Virginians so much that they joined. So she makes the argument that it's possible we wouldn't have even had an American Revolution if it wasn't for the institution of slavery and for black people actively like organizing to figure out what they're going to do with Dunmore's proclamation. They weren't just passive. And then she talks about the struggle for voting rights in the United States and argues that African Americans have, in their history, held us to the promise of the United States because we haven't always had democracy. We haven't always fulfilled the American promise. Um, and it's African Americans who have, through their activism, pushed the United States into more democracy. So in light of democracy days and even the, the pushback that we're experiencing against democracy um, at this time in history, I thought it was a really good way to discuss African Americans' contributions to democracy and also the role that Greenwood plays in that. So um, I think um, cemeteries, which some people find creepy, I love cemeteries. I think they're like a, a history museum. Um, when I go to the grave of someone who I learn about and study about, I feel like I'm meeting them. Um, and it's a really neat experience to research and learn about the ordinary people that are buried there. And there's been a lot of news articles about the public history role of, um, of African American cemeteries. And public history in itself is, if I go back, I forgot to even mention that, public history is the use of historical skilled and methods, skills and methods outside the traditional academic realm of history. Public historians use their training to meet the needs of the community and the public wherever that community is defined as a city, neighborhood, a business, or a historical society. And in that role, I definitely see Greenwood Cemetery fulfilling that, meeting the needs of the community, sharing the stories that are being told there, and sharing the larger national story of the United States. And we can use these black cemeteries, preserving them and studying the people who are buried there can tell us so much about the history of the United States and democracy. So that leads us to Greenwood. Um, so this is a cemetery in Hillsdale, Missouri. And I'm gonna pass it over to Shelly and she's gonna tell you a little bit about Greenwood. Well, thank you so much for having us here. Again, my name is Shelly Morrison. And I'm the board secretary, but also from time to time get to help at a, uh, with our history. Greenwood was formed in 1874 by a caretaker who actually worked down the street at St. Peter's Cemetery. He thought it was an opportunity to make money because there were very few places African Americans could be buried post-Civil War. So he bought approximately 10 acres of land, farmland, and by the end of the 1800s, that had grown to just under 32 acres. There were over 50,000 predominantly African Americans uh, buried at Greenwood Cemetery. And with that, so many of these people had something to do with the rich history of St. Louis. And Etta and I get to tell those stories, and it's really just been a journey for myself 
uh, to learn, as, as what Grace was saying, when you pass by a headstone, you want to know more. And uh, so that's where I am today. And also get to cut grass out there. But according to the dictionary, one of the definitions of democracy is this, a social condition of equality and respect for the individual within the community. Today, we would like to discuss a group of men embodying that definition. These men and their legacies can be traced for over 100 years, from the, from the time of slavery to the White House. The men in question were known as the Pullman Porters, and this is the story of their contributions to democracy. Oh, no. Click it for me. Okay. Is that where you want? Uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. By 1850, the United States had grown from 3.5 million people, including 700,000 enslaved persons, to 23 million, including 3 million enslaved persons. The 1803 Louisiana Purchase added 828,000 acres, doubling the size of the United States. Until then, water had been the primary source of transportation for both people and for freight. Since then, the land west of the Mississippi was not located on a major waterway, and the accepted practice of building canals really wasn't practical. New ways needed to be found. By, by the 1850s, railroads were increasingly supplementing the steamboats. Wealthy investors were making a fortune, and the railroads created jobs. While the, tra while the train travel of the day was a definite improvement, over stagecoaches and horse-powered means of transportation, it was far from comfortable. S sleeping cars, frequently described as cramped and smelly, had existed since the 1830s. But one man in the industry had a vision. His thought was to bring European, European luxury and convenience to the growing United States railroad industry. He wanted to do so by building sleeping cars complete with chandeliers, comfortable beds, and gourmet meals. Air conditioning became available in the 1930s, making the train experience even more enjoyable. By 1859, as the railroads expanded their reach across America, George Pullman, an engineer and industrialist, convinced the Chicago, Alton, and St. Louis Railroad to let him convert two old passenger cars into new and improved sleepers. The more, these more comfortable and luxurious sleeping cars were an instant hit, affording wealthier passengers the amenities they were accustomed to at home, and it also allowed the middle class to get a taste of the good life. It was a very much sought after experience. One of the luxuries that the Pullman offered was impeccable service. Pullman hired only black men, and many of them were formerly enslaved uh, from the South. They were hired as porters, cooks, servers, and red caps for that service. The first Pullman porter began working in 1867. George Pullman was opened by his reason for hiring black men. He reasoned that former house slaves that would be best known to how to cater to his customers every whim, and they would work long hours for cheap wages. He also thought, and get this, the black porters, especially the ones with darker skin, would be more invisible to his white upper and middle class passengers, making it easier for them to feel comfortable in their surrounding. A porter was expected to greet passengers, carry baggage from up to the sleeping berths, serve food, drinks, and, uh, and, and to bring uh, anything that the passenger wanted. And that includes shining their shoes, keeping the cars tidy, I mean absolutely anything that they would desire. He was expected to arrive at work several hours to prepare the car, time for which he was not compensated for. He would be charged for any island items that were stolen, even by the passengers that they saw as souvenirs. He would be charged for that. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine at the end of the day, he's got to give an inventory. And anything missing, he'd have to replace it or pay for it out of his wages. He needed to be available night and day to work on pass to, to, to wait on passengers. 
he was expected to smile. Having a Pullman meet your needs was a vital selling point for, for, for the world-class traveling experience. As the demand for Pullman cars and its growing workforce increased, Pullman Palace Car Company grew rapidly. In 1880, Pullman purchased 4,000 acres of land near Lake Cal Cal Umba, <laughs> Cal Calumet in Illinois, where he built a new plant and a company town. Initially, many of the workers lived in Pullman, and, and most of them were from Scandinavia, Germany, Ireland, and England. African Americans were not allowed to live there, not till many, many decades later. During the 1900s, a time where other businesses didn't want to hire African Americans, the Pullman Company became the largest single employers of black men in America. By 1920, the company had the distinction of being the fourth largest in Illinois and the second largest in the nation. Underpaid, overworked, and subjected to constant racism, the Pullman Porter often faced disrespect, often called George or boy by passengers. The, the Porter worked up to 400 hours or 11,000 miles a month with very little sleep or no time off. And that include any, there, I mean, he had to, when, the, when he worked over 20 hours, he wasn't compensated, he wasn't given a time to rest. Each man had to purchase his own uniform and any supplies that he would need to perform his job. So if he was shining someone's shoes, he had to purchase all of that. The cost would average anywhere from 200 to 400 a year, however, the average wage of the porter was approximately $879 a year, which had to be supplemented with tips. Tipping was built into the pay structure, which, served the, which saved the company money. Soliciting for tips fueled their later reputation as grinning Uncle Toms, who exaggerated their servitude in order to increase their tips. Some porters were requested or required to entertain passengers aboard the trains by singing or dancing. Walter Cannon was a Pullman porter and gave a lengthy interview about his life as a porter. Servility and the ever ready smile are the chief stock of the trade in the, of the Pullman porter. He, he had appeared thankful for his gratitudes, however small. He was once reprimanded by management when a passenger complained about his attitude when he didn't respond to a small tip, as he put it, one thin dime. His superintendent pointed out the window at a, at a man, at a black man working, digging up a sewer ditch. That man was paid $1.50 a day, and that Cannon made $2.50 each night that he was apparently, uh, that he apparently didn't appreciate. He knew the jobs like his were hard to come by, and he knew he had to change his approach. Like many Pullman porters, he knew he would never be considered for a promotion as a conductor, as that position was reserved for whites only. There was little job security, and porters could be suspended or terminated for the most trivial reasons. There was always another man to take his place. Mr. Gannon is one of several Pullman porters that are buried in Greenwood Cemetery. The porter was a servant as well as a host. He had the best job in his community and the worst job on the train. He could be trusted with his white passenger's children for their safety and, and just anything that they needed, but only for those five days across the country. He shared his writer's most private moments, but to that, he remained an enigma, if not an enemy to them. But in his community, he was held in great respect. Working as a porter was a coveted job, a career, and to, and to many people, his, their brothers, their sons, their grandsons, they all wanted to follow in his footsteps. In St. Louis, they helped bolster the black middle class and were able to have better homes. Black historians and civil rights activists, Tumiel Black said in a 2013 interview, the Pullman Porter was good looking, clean, immaculate in their dress. Their style was quite manly. 
their language was carefully crafted and so that they had a sense of intelligence about themselves. They were good role models for young men. Being a Pullman porter was a presti prestigious position because it offered a steady income and an opportunity to travel across the country, which was rare for many black people at that time. They were better compensated than most black workers at that, at that time and uh, actually through many periods uh, during the, um, from the 1800s all the way to the 1960s, enabling some porters to save money to send their children to historically black colleges. Furthermore, they were not subjected to the grueling back-raking field work common to the plantation of the sharecropper. As he traveled the country, he was exposed to new experiences. He kept up with the latest news and trends. He was often privy to, to the private conversations of politicians, actors, and sports figures. He used the railways to spread ideas about freedom and then the opportunity to black communities across the nation. Porters distributed newspapers to places in the, that were often banned in the South. Information and experiences gathered from their travels could, could be compared to the social media of today. Their news was always current. The Pullman Porter also hired African-American women as maids to care for women's needs. Maids needed uh, assisted in bathing, manicures, hairdressing, press clothing, shine shoes, and also help with their children. By the mid-1920s, Pullman employed over 200 maids and over 10,000 porters. As Pullman porters became famous for their superior service, many former porters moved on to other jobs in fine hotels, restaurants, and even some went to the White House. Porter J.W. Mays first served President William McKinley in his sleeping car, and he would later spend more than four decades in the White House serving McKinley and the eight presidents who followed him. Nevertheless, these black porters exhibited great pride in their work. Their presence and their influence would play an instrumental role in the great migration from the South, fueling the rise of the new black middle class and igniting the 1960s civil rights. In, the, in many black circles, being a Pullman porter was a prized job, fostered a lasting generational legacy for families and for their relatives. From servitude to activism. the Pullman Palace Car Company employed over 12,000 black men, most of whom were porters on sleeper cars. Pullman porters were the lowest paid of all the Pullman employees. Even though their monthly wages had increased over the years, porters on regular assignments earned 28 cents an hour while workers in unionized manufacturing jobs average 55 cents an hour. But most of these manufacturing jobs were not open to black men, nor were the unions who represented them. Porters depended on tips to make ends meet, just as their fathers and grandfathers had. But this was a new generation of men. Unlike their fathers and grandfathers, they were more likely to admire the words of W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey than Booker T. Washington or Frederick Douglass. But like their fathers and grandfathers, they lived in a society where it was almost impossible for a black man, even an educated black man, to find a job. So they were grateful for an opportunity to earn a living. But gratitude was wearing thin. By the 1920s, most other Pullman employees were members of the American Federation of Labor, and their wages had been brought in line with industry standards. But none of the labor unions would accept black members. On four occasions, porters had organized and had attempted to take their grievances to the Pullman Company. Each attempt was met by reactions raging, ranging from condescension to violence. 
but the porter's salary and their working conditions remain the same. Okay. In an attempt to appease but to still remain firmly in control, the Pullman Company created a benefit program to ad address the issues raised by porters. It was an attempt to create the sense of having a union, but it was not a union. The company chose the representatives. The company chose the issues to be discussed. The company even advised the representatives how they should vote. Next slide. Pullman Porter newsletters of the 1920s from time to time fe featured photos like this one of a prosperous looking benefits board. But apparently that prosperity did not filter down to the rank and file porters because their, con their uh, concerns were still unanswered. So there they were, in between a rock and a hard place. The company refused to deal with their concerns as union membership would have required, and all the unions continued to ban black membership. The only recourse for black workers was to form their own union. A meeting was called, we can switch, okay. A meeting was called and on August 25th, 1925, Pullman Porters came together in New York City and the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters was born. The organization's motto was fight or be slaves and its new leader was a man named Asa Philip Randolph. Randolph had been carefully chosen. He had no ties with the railroad industry, no ties with the Pullman Company, no ties really with the porters themselves, but he was well known as a speaker and well known as a labor organizer. He was well connected on, among New York's black elite, and most of all, he was pro-union. News of the Brotherhood spread quickly. Layovers between work assignments sometimes involved dozens, even hundreds of porters gathered in quarters provided by the company. These quarters could be in hotels, rooming houses, the YMCA, or anywhere that there was suitable space. The porters who gathered for rest and recreation might be from New York or Kansas City, from Tampa, Jacksonville, St. Louis, Boston, or Oakland, California. And when they left, their next assignment might take them and their news about the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to any point along that old railroad map that you see there. News of the union did not escape the Pullman Company either. At first, the company ignored the new union. As a high-ranking Pullman official put it, here was a handful of colored people, Negroes, who got together and took on the Pullman Company. The Pullman Company, one of the most powerful companies in the United States of America. But as 1925 became 1926 and then 1927, as interest in the Brotherhood remained strong, while interest in the company union continued to be mostly negative, the company decided to take a different approach. Through the years, Pullman Executive had cultivated a close relationship with black community leaders by pouring money into institutions and promoting the image of Pullman as a friend of not just workers, but of the entire black community. As a result, many black leaders opposed the BSCP. Early in the labor movement, the black community had been a solid support system for the union. But with a few well-placed donations from Pullman officials, churches that had, had allowed the Brotherhood to meet were no longer available. Preachers no longer praised the union from their pulpits. Newspapers no longer printed favorable articles. Editors and ministers alike pointed out that the Pullman Company was the single largest employers of black workers in the country and asked, is it wise to bite the hand that feeds you? The BSCP first faced long odds. Despite its char charismatic leadership, the union had attracted only a small number of rank and file workers and had failed to enroll a majority of working porters. 
Most black leaders outside the organization distrusted labor unions and viewed George Pullman as an important ally of black people. A. Philip Randolph was accused of being a communist sympathizer and of mismanaging brotherhood funds. One newspaper went as far as to report that Randolph had run away to Moscow with $72,000 of the Brotherhood's money. It's very unlikely the Brotherhood ever had $72,000, but that's what the newspaper reported. For more than 10 years, the BSCP fought a three-front battle against the Pullman Car Company, against the American Federation of Labor, and sometimes against anti-union, pro-Pullman sentiments present in the black community itself. Randolph and other BSCP leaders told their, appoint, their opponents that while Pullman might provide jobs, it was a racist institution that treated porters and maids like slaves. It deprived them of their dignity and oppressed them on their jobs. They told anyone who would listen the union meant fair paying jobs and jobs meant progress. While the Pullman Company and the Brotherhood were busy attacking each other, there was something else going on in the United States. Something that would affect every working man in the United States for nearly a decade. And that something was the Great Depression. The Great Depression was a period of severe economic downturn that began around September 1929 and lasted until roughly 1939. Fallout from the Depression was widespread, including a se severe decline in rail travelers. Fewer jobs for porters meant massive layoffs and also meant fewer tips for those porters who did manage to keep their jobs. With less income available to Pullman Porter families, there was a sharp decline in BSCP membership. There were 7,300 paid BSC members in 1929. That number had dropped to 658 by 1933. Some folks went as far as to say that the union was dead. The BSC was reduced to a skeleton crew, but its leaders continued to preach black trade unions, insisting that black workers deserve the same right of representation that their white counterparts did. As the Depression got worse and things got more desperate for poor people, significant numbers of black leaders began supporting the BSCP and its pro-black jobs message. The sheer persistence of union leaders and the strength of the union, and the strength that the union had gained in the black community pushed the American Federation of Labor to grant the BSCP full membership in 1935. As full members of a recognized national labor union, the BSCP was entitled to union support when they entered into labor talks. If a strike was to be called, uh, the Brotherhood could expect to be supported by member unions of the powerful American Federation of Labor. But a strike would not be needed. Next one. After protracted and often contentious, nego contentious negotiations, a contract between the BSCP and the Pullman Palace Car Company was signed in 1937. As a result, Porter's minimum hourly wages were increased, their work hours were re reduced, and for the first time, there was overtime pay. Never before had a union successfully negotiated for better pay and working conditions for black people, but the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters had gone toe to toe with one of the most powerful com companies in the nation and that handful of colored people had won. The impact of Pullman Porter stretched far beyond the railroad. Uh, with lasting economic, social, and cultural effects, Porters had served as change agents for their communities, carrying new musical forms, jazz for example, new radical ideas from urban centers to rural areas, 
and from north to south. Their influence undoubtedly helped fuel the Great Migration, during which some six million African Americans relocated from the south to urban regions in the north and west. By viewing the lives of wealthier white Americans, you can switch to the next one, up close, Pullman porters were clearly able to see the differences between their lives and between the, the lives of these wealthy Americans and their own lives. Armed with this knowledge, many porters served as, saved up money to send their children and grandchildren through college and on to graduate school, giving their descendants the education and opportunities that they themselves had not had. We can find vestiges of the influence of the Pullman porters in their descendants who went on to create, you can flip it up one, to create the bedrock for the nation's black professional class. A. Philip Randolph used the BSCP and later his own positions in the AFL-CIO leadership as a wedge for breaking down racial segregation in the American labor movement. The BSCP was a source of information and activism in, Af in African American communities and provided a training ground <clears throat> for future community leaders. One final note, St. Louis and Ed Bradley, Edward James Bradley, better known as Brad, was a founding member and third vice president of the International Executive Board of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. He was an active member of the Brotherhood until his death in 1959. His death certificate listed his occupation as retired Pullman Porter, but what it didn't mention was his monumental contributions to the African American struggle in the labor movement or his contributions to democracy. Edward J. Bradley was buried at Historic Greenwood Cemetery in Hillsdale, Missouri on July 2nd, 1959. And as Grace pointed out, uh, as she began the program, this is how we can teach black history. Kiana, do you wanna talk next about, well, I was just gonna say that, um, thank you, thank you, Etta and Shelley. Mm. Um, I wanted to put this up here because um, I wanted you guys to know how you can get involved at Greenwood. Um, so I teach classes here at SCC that are service learning based. Service le Has anybody had a service learning class before? No? Okay, well service learning is, is a pretty cool thing. It's kind of like community service, but it has a purpose. So service learning is different than just community service because the service learning that you're doing, the community service that you're doing is uh, enhancing your learning in the course. So I teach history classes and I have my students doing history work with Greenwood Cemetery. So preserving the stories of the people buried there and reclaiming the land from <laughs> secondary growth, um, going out and working there. So um, service learning has been a big part of my collaboration with Greenwood. Um, and it's been so exciting to see students write papers and reflections about their work at Greenwood um, and just having it really make a difference. Um, so uh, service learning is one way that you can get involved and um, it is a form of civic engagement and I think that's kind of a good transition. Do you wanna still talk, Kiana, about your experience? Okay. Hi, I'm Kiona um, and I'm a student at Wash U. Um, and I would say that for me, I have always been pretty involved with community service and service learning. Um, for me, it kind of started when I was going to church with my family, and then that was a really important portion of like community service and my faith. Um, but as I've grown older, it has expanded. Um, how I got to getting involved with Greenwood Cemetery was um, in one of my classes, we were learning about cemeteries and one of my professors kind of made this, um, basically was like, oh yeah, this is where like most St. Louisans like wanted to be buried. Um, and then I started thinking about 
black history and where black St. Louisans were able to be buried. Um, that's how I did. And it has been a really rewarding experience. I have been um, there as we've been physically recovering the land. But what has also been very significant has been beyond just the physical labor, the uncovering of stories. Um, we have had the opportunity, I've gotten to witness with Shelly and Etta um, what it feels like to connect family members with um, with their family history and with their ancestors who they thought were their they thought their graves were gone forever and I think that's a really um, important portion of grief that is not really mentioned often is like sometimes you physically lose somebody and that's really hard and I think about when you lose somebody and you're not even able to go and visit their graves because it's been overgrown um, and I think that's like a secondary part of grief that um, a lot of people whose family members have been buried in ne neglected cemeteries deal with and I think it's really admirable just seeing firsthand the work that both of these amazing women have been doing to give families closure has been really impactful and I do see a lot of young people in the room and I would just really encourage you to get involved in preservation work because I I I love our generation so much because we care so much about so many different issues and I find that it's really sad when our generation isn't as involved with preservation work because there is a lot of overlap between all these different things that we care about, like racial injustice and environmental issues. There is a lot of overlap with preservation work. And I know that a lot of the time, like our generation is really attracted to like very visual modes of of social justice, like we love protests and we love all these very quick and urgent things. And I would argue that preservation work is also really urgent. Um, and history is only alive as long as young people choose to care for it. So I would just encourage you all to get involved with Greenwood or with other modes of preservation because as we've been speaking about, public history is a really good way to um, democratize education. So thank you. Do you, do you want to speak a little bit about like the preservation that's happened, Etta? The kinds of preservation at Greenwood? Yeah, like, like explain what, what Greenwood looked like before oh, heavens. you guys came in. <laughs> yeah, uh, imagine a jungle, basically. That's what we're talking. When I started with Greenwood, and it's been more than 20 years ago now, uh, you could see perhaps 50 yards into the cemetery. The cemetery is 38 point, what, 8525 acres. 32.85 acres, and the only clear space was probably the area of a block, a city block. Uh, we have, Grace mentioned dealing with predators, and that's what I have to call them, predators who were willing to come in and just take that land away from us. And had it not been for the fact that we were, say, we were on the ball and we were saying, no, you cannot destroy people's history, that would have been gone. So yeah, it was a mess, but it's, it's so much better now. I, I like Keon, I would encourage you to come out, at least you know, walk around, take a visit. Uh, for African-American students, perhaps find out if, you, if your relatives if you have any relatives buried at Greenwood, our experience has been if your family has been in the city of St. Louis for more than a couple of generations, you probably have people buried at Greenwood because of the fact that for a very long time, for 21 years, Greenwood was the only black cemetery in the city. So I don't want to take up too much time because I got a couple other things I want to say. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, don't, don't be, shy. be shy. Okay, well, I'm gonna tell you what, before I forget this, I have a comment, and this is especially for the young people out in the audience. With all the fuss that Texas and Florida and Missouri are making over banning black studies, banning black history, one would think that black history has always been a part of our educational process. It has not. I'm sitting here, so you, you, I'm still alive. You're looking at me, you're listening to me. When I was a child, black history was taught 
was not taught on in any public school on any level. It was not taught in elementary school, it was not taught in high school, and it was not taught in college. So it's not as if this has been something that the United States has magnanimous, magnam, mm, has granted us, you know, the teaching of our history. Um, this, this whole thing to me, if you are not very careful, is just something that's glossing over yet another truth. Black history has not been a part of um, African American history for more than, I would say, 40, 50 years. So this banning is just totally outrageous. I was going to say there's a long history of black activism to get that story included mm -hmm. in the schools. Um, you know, it goes back to like early 20th century. Um, well, I mean, even before that, but early 20th century, the work of like Carter G. Woodson and um, some of those other early black history advocates, like Black History Month used to be a week, like a week of school. Mm -hmm. um, and even now, like a lot of it's just relegated to a month. And it's like not very much history. Like when right. I was in school, like we learned about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and that was it. And that was it. Right. And that was exactly. it. Exactly. Uh -huh. And I think that like when I first started history, like um, I didn't, well, first of all, I was encouraged to not do anything other than military history because history is a very male dominated field. <laughs> um, and that was just the expectation that women would go towards the poo poo history, which was like women's history and African American history. But I find it's like, that is like what I'm fascinated in. Like that's where all the good stories are. And I, I'm really drawn to um, Nicole Hannah Jones's argument that, you know, everything that's great about America, like everything that we admire about the United States, like this, this ideal of democracy and equality, like the people who have been holding America to that ideal have been the African American communities and other minority communities within the country. You know, I just think that's a really exciting thing about history. Um, so it makes me sad that I see schools pushing back against it, but it's not new. I mean, that pushback has always been there. Like exactly. what's new is that we had it in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And even in the curriculum, like I'm sure if you guys reflect on your school experience, you probably didn't have that much curriculum to begin with. Um, so it's kind of funny, but not funny. It's ironic that, you know, there's this idea that we're trying to shove it down everybody's throats, but it is what makes America. Black history is American history. Exactly. It's part of the United States. It's like a part of our story. And um, I think that's what's so influential about the 1619 Project is black Americans have been here since the beginning of America, and they're a part of that history too. I was gonna mention that if you're not taking a service learning class, I don't know if we're gonna be doing it this year because service learning has gone through a bit of a struggle with like um, new leadership. But usually we have what's called a week of service that even if you're not in a service learning class, we have activities that you can volunteer at for that week. Do you know, Vicki, if we're gonna be doing it this year? I'm not certain we're gonna do it this semester, maybe in the spring. Um, but I always do an SEC trip to Greenwood. I might still do it even if we don't have a week of service where you can volunteer to come out with a group of other students and do some work. Last time we did it, it was really cool. We were documenting, like there was a recently unburied um, zone of the cemetery and we were documenting the tombstones that we could see um, just in case if it did get overgrown again, we would know who was buried there. One of the other things that we do with Greenwood as students is we research the death certificate database um, because some of the many records were lost due to the family drama for who owned the cemetery, is that right, Etta? Mm -hmm. So burial records were just disappeared and Etta and Shelley have found a way to rebuild lost records by reading through the thousands of death certificates, like historic death certificates that are available. So here's actually an example of what that looks like. This is for um, um, Mr. Bradley. And that's where mm -hmm. it says he's a retired Pullman porter. I went in and looked up his death certificate and added it to this. Um, but we're looking through like people's names, like the um, their color or their race. Um, we're looking at like uh, their cause of death. I actually took that off because I felt like it was maybe private and shouldn't be like 
put forward for everybody to see. But you can document, it tells them the place of burial um, and it's Greenwood and so it's a really indirect way. And actually I was thinking maybe we should talk to whoever made that database and see if they can make the cemetery searchable, one of the searchable data. Because right now it's not mm. the place of burial. Maybe they can get it added. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like, maybe we can even get, like, an internship and have them read through the death certificates. I was an intern for the Missouri State Archives oh. at one point. It'd be interesting. So, anybody have any other questions or anybody else on the panel want to mention anything? Okay. Uh, Yes. Yes. <laughs> More than one, actually. Yes, yeah, Sage Chapel Cemetery is one. Uh -huh. um, and I mean, like, black people were buried in, like, church cemeteries and places like that. Um, it's just Greenwood was a non-sectarian um, cemetery during segregation. Um, but St. Charles has, like, like Doris Keevan Frank has done a lot of research into the black cemetery that's in St. Charles. Um, so Sage Chapel Cemetery has some. Do you know of any other ones that I'm not thinking of? I can't of? remember the name, but there is another one. But I think the interesting thing about St. Charles Black Cemeteries is they really are directly connected to slavery. Yeah. There is no independent, you know, after slavery Black Cemetery out this way. Well, I mean, like, there was always Black people living in St. Charles, but oh, a lot of their of story was that they uh -huh. were slaves. But many of those people then were buried in the city of St. Louis. Oh, okay. Uh, not, not just St. Charles County, but far St. Louis County as well. Yeah. Because, you know, segregation in St. Louis was cradle to grave. And that meant from the time you were born till the time you died, you were probably going to be affected by segregation. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> learn more um, and like volunteer to help out? Yes, we do. Uh, if you just look up greenwoodstl.org, you'll be able to find us. But also too, if you'd like to come out, if any of you would like to come out and help, because we definitely need volunteers, please reach out. And uh, we're usually there Saturday mornings, but we're able to uh, be a little flexible. If your schedule is a little crazy, we can make it crazy with you. <laughs> so uh, please don't hesitate to to come out and uh, oh did you oh bless your heart thank you oh, okay. <laughs> so there we are <laughs> but please uh, come on out you know you will enjoy yourself it's hard work uh, but when you when you're done you feel good don't, what are the events coming up one of our events coming up this coming Saturday we have friends and family. And there we will, uh, well, actually, we have a, a person that is documenting the history of Greenwood Cemetery. Her name is Lucretia Griffin Pope. And so uh, she's getting ready to wrap up the documentary. But she still is doing some interviews for a lot of people who are descendants of those that are buried there. Uh, we will also be helping or assisting people find their loved ones. So we'll be running around. Uh, making sure that people know the where they're going and just assisting in any kind of way. People coming from all over the country looking for yeah. ones, right? We have, we've been blessed. Uh, we've had people give us a call from all over the country. They heard what we've been doing as far as our restoration. And they've been coming in town, flying in from all over to finally see where their loved one is buried. I had a gentleman come out yesterday. He lost his mother at the age of 13. He was from Kansas City, drove in just for that. And he hadn't been out there in 45 years. He didn't know where she was. And so to be able to show him where his mom is, is, is such an experience that you just, there are no words for it. Uh, and so this is why we do what we do. What about, um, what's going on with Harriet Scott? Oh, yeah. On October 14th, we're gonna be setting a headstone for Harriet Scott. She was the Freedom Suit Petitioner, uh, she and her husband, Dred Scott. Uh, we will be setting a headstone for her actual burial location. And that will be at 11 o'clock, Saturday, October 14th. So please, if you're not doing anything, come out and join us. Is that the same day that they're doing Dred? No, 
uh, Dred Scott's, had, they actually have a new headstone, a monument for Dred Scott, and that's in Calvary Cemetery. They're going to be unveiling that September 30th at 11 o'clock. And again, the public, it's open to the public, I do believe. I think one of the things that we didn't mention, I don't, I don't remember hearing, is that Greenwood Cemetery is actually on the National Register of Historic Places and has been since 2004. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that sort of gives you some indication of where we fit in as far as St. Louis and Missouri history is concerned. Um, also in October, the St. Louis Public, we get, a, we get a lot of interest in various things. St. Louis Public Library is going to be coming out to join us. We'll have a little tour of the cemetery, but then they have some experts who are going to be teaching us how to clean headstones. Okay. So if that's something that you might be interested in, you know, we could pass that information that's on to you as well. Oh, okay. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to say thank you for allowing us to speak and share one of our stories. We often get a, get a chance to tell so many stories because it's such a rich place. And, uh, but we appreciate your time and sitting here listening to us. It's, it's been a pleasure for us. Mm -hmm. And oh, if there are you. any points, at, and you know, I don't know what kind of research you are required to do in your classes or anything, but if there are any point that you want to um, research or talk about someone who is not Martin Luther King or <laughs> you know, whatever, then come on out and give us a, give us a holler. Yeah. It's amazing the amount of history that we have yeah. that connects right back to national history. Exactly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone.